Tonight on Politicat, breaking down the conflict in Sudan and what it means for U.S. citizens. A look into Twitter's new verification requirements, how paying for the blue checkmark will impact users. And how restrictions on national access to trans health care is affecting LGBTQ plus students on campus. Those stories and more tonight on Politicat. It's your politics right, right now. now. Hello and good evening. I'm Maria Heim. And I'm Jeremy Fredericks. Let's get right into tonight's political news. Starting off with some news from Sudan. The country has been engulfed in war since mid-April. As of Saturday, the latest death toll rising to 528, with close to 5,000 more injured. The turmoil follows the outing of former President Omar al-Bashir in 2019 and a military coup which dissolved the government's power-sharing government two years ago. Violence erupted during negotiations between Sudan's official military and the Rapid Support Forces, a paramilitary group, over how the two would be integrated. Tens of thousands have already fled the war-torn country, with the United States also making efforts to evacuate hundreds of its citizens. We're joined now by Lance Wilhelm and Louis Castaneda, who have some critical insight on the conflict. Lance, let's begin with you. You mentioned the conflict arose from failed negotiations between those two military factions. Could you explain who those factions are and why they began fighting? Right, so the Rapid Support Forces are headed by General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, who first rose to power in the Darfur region of Sudan, where he put down an insurgency under the reign of former Sudanese President al-Bashir. Um, al uh, Dagalo then worked with al-Burhan, the general of the actual Sudanese army, to overthrow President al-Bashir, who gave those two men their positions of power in 2019. Um, and conflict arose when al-Bashir excuse me, Al-Burhan and Dagalo were negotiating how to integrate the rapid support forces into the official Sudanese military. Dagalo felt that his position of power was threatened, which prompted the, the violent war. And Lewis, let's turn, just like how the war between Russia and Ukraine, this is gonna have some global ramifications. What could we see coming out of this war? I mean, first off, much like the war in Europe, we've already seen alliances form in Sudan, right? The Sudan army is thought to have the support from Egypt, but officially their stance is neutral. The RSF has the ally allied support of United Arab Emirates and Russia's private military group, also known as the Wagner Group. Russia itself has had plans to involve itself in African countries. For example, building a naval base at Port Sudan. The US has made efforts to push for democracy in the country, largely with economic incentives and aid. Sudan, of course, is a very large country with a lot of resources, but primarily they have five countries that border the country, such as Libya, Chad, Central African Republic, and Eritrea. We could very well see external intervention between these countries with their borders considered by many as porous. And Lance, masses of civilians are fleeing Sudan amid the crisis. Where are they going and how are they being dealt with? Right, so the UN has already cut aid efforts in the area because it's considered too dangerous. I mean, as a result, the UN is expecting around 800,000 people to flee Sudan, which, as some context, is roughly 2% of the population there. Um, these uh, individuals are fleeing across borders to Egypt, which has already received 40,000 refugees, uh, Chad, Ethiopia, Djibouti. Many of those countries have already made conscious efforts to help those refugees uh, fleeing that dangerous Sudan region. And Lewis, could there be an end to sight in this conflict? You know, it's certainly unclear, but we could very well see three scenarios playing out. Number one, a swift military victory. Military is divided currently by the junta. Um, the, the Sudan army is led by the president, and the vice president has the RSF, of course. Well, the RSF has the upper hand right now in the capital. Their guerrilla warfare has made them very flexible. But the Sudanese army has more military, has more artillery, and has um, just a lot more resources in that regards. Former leader Omar al-Bashir has noted for creating division. So that leads us into our second um, possibility, an all-out civil war that's prolonged. And that's horrible for the people of Sudan, but it could very well be a possibility with these leaders uh, taking part in these divisivenesses. Uh, and third, hopefully we can reach a peaceful deal. 
Um, but what we have here is two men fighting for wealth and power at the expense of the Sudanese citizens. Although both generals have been talking about a ceasefire and diplomats have been helping, there have been proposals that the only way that this peace could, um, peace treaty could end uh, is through external pressures such as through Egypt, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. Lance and Lewis, thanks so much for joining us. And now for some news from Congress. Last week, House Republicans voted to pass a bill that would raise the nation's debt ceiling, but its chances of passing in the Democratic-led Senate are low. This bill passed with a narrow 217 to 215 votes and seeks to raise the $31.4 trillion debt ceiling by an additional $1.5 trillion in exchange for federal spending cuts. These cuts would include rescinding all unobliged COVID relief money, repeal President Biden's attempts to waive student loan debt, and expand work requirements for federal cash and food assistance. A vast majority of Democrats in both chambers oppose the proposed cuts, and President Biden said he would veto the bill if it reaches his desk. The president has also refused to sit down with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy to negotiate. Yesterday, U.S. Secretary Janet Yellen warned the U.S could default on its debt as early as June if nothing is done. Economists warned the U.S.'s first ever default would be the disastrous for the market. News from the White House. President Joe Biden announced last Tuesday that he intends to seek re-election for a second term. The president, currently 80 years old, is already the oldest president to have, been, to have ever served office. Politicat's David Gold is here with more. Thank you, Jeremy. Announcing his plan to seek re-election last week, the president is looking to fulfill a full eight years in office, despite his, aging, his advancing age. Biden's platform is continuing to restore the soul of the nation, a promise he ran on in 2020. In a video shared by his campaign, the president vowed to take on, quote, MAGA extremism. When announcing his plans for 2024, the president had this to say. When I ran for president four years ago, I said we're in a battle for the soul of America. And we still are. The question we're facing is whether in the years ahead we have more freedom or less freedom, more rights or fewer. I know what I want the answer to be, and I think you do too. This is not a time to be complacent. Fo the following, following president, incumbent presidents, do not face serious opposition in the primaries. However, President Biden is not the only Democrat throwing their hat in the ring for the 2024 race. Marion Williamson has joined the race for the second time in a row after not picking up a single electoral delegate in 2020. The former spiritual guru to Oprah Winfrey, Williamson has called for the creation of the Department of Peace. The final person running for the Democratic nation nomination is Robert F. Kennedy Jr., the son of Attorney General Robert Kennedy and nephew of President Kennedy. Kenny is a known anti-vaxxer and has made multiple false claims regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. The president does, however, face an uphill battle for re-election. In, in a recent news poll by NBC News, 70% of Americans, including 51% of Democrats, said they do not think the president should run for re-election. One of the main challenging challenges Biden is facing is his age. 46% of Americans said the president, who would be 86 at the end of his second term, said age was a major reason they do not want him to run again for president. In the same poll, only 41% of Americans said they would vote for the president again in a general election. Thank you, David. Politicat will continue to cover the 2024 election and its candidates in the coming weeks. Coming up after the break, looking into what's next for the, to ensuring access to the abortion pill, Mithil Pristone. And I take a look into Twitter's new verification policy. Stay tuned. Trying to work my way out of the prison system was the most difficult challenge of my life. It only became tangible once I became a Northwestern student. My relationship with Giannis is unique. We're from the same country, we're from the same city. Being a Northwestern alum, I think, has tremendous advantages in the sports industry. To me, that community, it's been with me for 20 plus years.
Welcome back. Does a blue check mark imply credibility? How do you determine who is credible and what's blue sky? All buzzing questions in today's tech landscape. Elon Musk, Twitter CEO, purged some check marks from verified accounts on April 20th. But don't worry, some accounts are still verified. It's all up to Twitter Blue. With the subscription, you pay $8 a month for additional services, including editing tweets within 30 minutes, scrolling through fewer ads, tweeting more than 280 characters, bolding, italicizing text, uploading longer videos, and of course, that blue check mark and the profile that meets eligibility criteria. And now, high profile accounts no longer have any verification. Take Northwestern University's account, for example, or former Northwestern News Network News Director Joey Safchik. She's even got the old photo of her old verified account there for context. Lastly, let's take a look at the city of Evanston. With no blue check mark for municipalities, they face situations like these. A fight between accounts to figure out which is the real one. The city of New York making a post stating the official account, but then a fake account replying, we're the real one in response. Today, the city of New York is verified as a government or multilateral association with a gray badge. There's also this gold check mark used for Twitter verified organizations, an icon recognizing institutions or businesses. Twitter Blue launched December 12th, and I myself was curious about the service, so I subscribed to Twitter Blue for about five months. However, I wasn't satisfied enough to continue subscribing, but let's take a look at Twitter Blue's impact on my account. Running the highlights, overall I gained 50 followers, had over 40,000 impressions in the last five months, and in the past three months, I had a total of almost 3,000 profile visits, over eight times as many followers as I have, and 20 mentions. But let's take a look at the new followers. As we can see here, it peaking in January, as I gained about 14 new followers up on your screen soon, um, and then taking a look at the Twitter impressions, the peak is between February and March, which you'll be seeing on your screen soon as well. A helpful insight for sure, but looking at the past three months, I had the most profile visits in February in the verified account, but this surely declined. Because of this today, some Twitter users are logging off. Blue Sky Social, a new app from founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, launched an invite-only alternative to Twitter. Celebrities like Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is among hundreds of thousands who have joined already. The platform aims to decentralize the network's meaning, but not just for one person. Like Musk for Twitter, for example, is making the decisions. They intend for each server to create rules for a community on Blue Sky, a feature to come. This discussion raises the question, though, does social media have enough value for individuals to pay for extra services? The story continues to develop. Yesterday, some big news in the banking world as First Republic Bank became the third to fail since March. The Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, seized control of the bank over the weekend before overseeing its sale to J.P. Morgan Chase. First Republic's steep decline became apparent when it announced last Monday a $100 billion loss in deposits over the past three months. This is despite receiving a $30 million rescue package from private sector banks last month. First Republic is the second largest bank failure in American history, with a total of $213 billion worth of assets. First Republic's 84 branches opened yesterday under J.P. Morgan Chase's name, and no customers have reported losses from this financial failure, and depositors still have full access to their money through J.P. Morgan. Some updates on the pending access to the abortion pill Mifepristone. As of now, the pill remains accessible nationwide, with the Supreme Court blocking a lower court decision banning or limiting the FDA-approved use of the drug. The court's ruling preserving the pill's availability in states where abortion is legal for up to 10 weeks in a pregnancy. The case is now in the hands of the 5th U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals, which has scheduled oral arguments for May 17th, and President Biden said that he will continue to defend the Food and Drug Administration's approval of Mifepristone. The case will most likely end up back in the Supreme Court with a potential decision made in the next term. Joining us now here in the studio are Lena Peterson and Naya Reyes to explain what we can expect from the court. Starting off with you, Lena, what does the Supreme Court's decision in the legal fight over abortion pills mean for access to Mifepristone? 
Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so nationwide access will be preserved for now after the Supreme Court blocked a federal judge's ruling in Texas. Mifepristone is still available in the 37 states that legally allow abortion in some form of medication. And the Supreme Court's decision upholds the status quo for now until the Fifth Circuit Court takes the case again in mid-May. So this is an approaching issue, and turning now to you, Naya, what exactly is this lawsuit alleging? Yeah, so the anti-abortion groups, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, are suing the FDA to seek overturn of the FDA's 2000 approval of the pill. The sa they're saying that the drug is not safe and it was not properly evaluated back when it was first approved. The group, in short, is looking to decrease access to the pill. Thanks. And Lena, if mifepristone is ultimately blocked, what options remain for those who are seeking to terminate pregnancies? Yeah, so if mifepristone is no longer available, many abortion clinics plan on using misoprostol alone to terminate pregnancies. And surgical abortions are still available in states where abortion is legal. However, nationwide, about 40% of providers do not offer procedural abortions and are medication only. And now to you, Naya, what can we expect to happen next? Yeah, so like Lena said, access to the pill has, has not been banned, but, and it will stay that way for now. Litigation will continue in the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals with oral arguments beginning May 17th. If it is blocked, abortion clinics will most likely use misoprostol, the other abortion pill, and there's a good chance that anti-abortion groups could look to ban misoprostol in the future. Access to the pill will decrease to just 17 states plus D.C. or fewer. And that issue is just on the come up in a couple of weeks. Thank you for that insight, Naya and Lena. Coming up after the break, how Montana's decision to restrict access to gender-affirming health care is impacting Northwestern students. Stay with us. Trying to work my way out of the prison system was the most difficult challenge of my life. It only became tangible once I became a Northwestern student. My relationship with Giannis is unique. We're from the same country, we're from the same city. Being a Northwestern alum, I think, has tremendous advantages in the sports industry. To me, that community, it's been with me for 20 plus years. Welcome back. Montana is in the new center for the fight for gender affirming care. Last week, the state passed a bill to restrict gender affirming care and barred a transgender lawmaker from the House floor. Politicat's Paris Fransway has more on the wider impacts of these bills. Gender affirming health care is protected in Illinois, but nationwide, 31 states have introduced or passed bills restricting access. The language of criminality is getting attached to um, accessing health care. 86 percent of transgender and non-binary youth say debates about anti-gender affirming care bills negatively impact their mental health according to the Trevor Project. We're focusing on, is this healthcare safe? And what we're not really asking ourselves is, um, isn't it unsafe to refuse to provide life-saving healthcare for trans people? These debates also promoting misinformation about the safety of gender-affirming care. Rhino Kelly is the Associate Director of Communications at Howard Brown Health Center a Chicago-based nonprofit LGBTQ healthcare and social services provider. It's a treatment method that has been reviewed, gone through studies, been approved for safety and for consistency, um, and we have standards around these. While many gender-affirming healthcare critics focus their rhetoric on transgender minors, the patients that we see for gender-affirming care are overwhelmingly adults. And patients from states with strict laws are now using Illinois resources. We have certainly seen an increasing amount of patients um, accessing either in person or through telehealth, trans health resources here, even though they don't live here. But with Illinois surrounded by states hostile to gender affirming care, it would be a mistake for us to think that just because we're protected here in Illinois, 
that um, our gender expansive community isn't still at risk. On Northwestern's campus, Multicultural Student Affairs, Gender and Sexuality Resource Center, and the Women's Center all have support and information for students. Affirming trans existence requires that we also provide access to gender affirming health care. The LGBTQ community adapting and standing up to national attacks on gender affirming care. Paris Fransway, Northwestern News Network. Thanks, Paris. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of Politicat. Have a great night.